Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Rusi. I'm not sure I'm allowed to welcome people to someone else's place, but welcome anyway. My name is Arnon Menon from King's College London, uh, and I run the UK in a changing Europe. And we, together with uh, Rusi, have organised this conference today. Let me start by just saying thank you to Jonathan Isle and Juliana, who have been uh, fantastic to collaborate with. Uh, Putting on a conference is never easy, but this has been relatively easy compared to some of the experiences we've had. I should also say, if you want Wi-Fi, you've got to go back to reception to get the login code, but it's on the reception desk. So if you want to do that at coffee time, you can do that. We did a conference here at Rusi uh, on, well, I don't think we called it Brexit then, on the referendum during the referendum campaign. Uh, which was interesting in all sorts of ways, not least the fact that the two messages that came out of the day were, one, foreign and security policy are really, really important, and two, it's slightly distressing how little attention they were getting in the referendum. And so to coin a phrase, I think we can quite safely say nothing has changed. Uh, defence and foreign policy remain important, and I'm struck again by the fact that in the Brexit process they've received surprisingly little interest uh, and have been relegated so far as we focus on rules of origin, tariffs and the like. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, though I'm sceptical, whether when the talks themselves start in March, this changes. But whether they change or not, there's an awful lot to pick through, I think, in terms of where Britain stands uh, in the world, where its foreign and security policy pr uh, priorities are and should be, both because of Brexit and because of wider changes going on in the world, and I'm delighted that we have Laurie Friedman here to kick us off and set us thinking. Laurie, I imagine all of you know already, he's a Professor Emeritus of War Studies at King's. He was a Professor of War Studies at King's from 1982 to 2014, uh, Vice Principal at King's from 2003 to 2013. He writes a book every six months, as far as I can see, but his last two uh, both absolutely fantastic. Strategy, a history, and the future of war, a history, I would recommend to you most strongly. So without further ado, Laurie, do you want to kick us off? Thank you. Thanks, now. Um, this is, you say, a very timely conference, and uh, I'm honoured to have been given the chance to kick it off. Uh, unusually for me, I have a script, so important do I think this occasion is. Um, so, uh, in order to develop a foreign policy appropriate for our circumstances and the challenges that we and the world f as a whole face, the starting point has to be realism about our international position and about our strengths and weaknesses. So much of the discussion on this topic in the past has assumed that we're entitled to our seat at the top table and that Britain is one of those countries uh, upon which world order uh, does and should depend. This is not immediately apparent at the moment to either the international community or, as importantly, to our own population. If we believe that the UK should be actively engaged internationally, then this is a case that needs to be made and not assumed. Brexit has given this matter some urgency because it suggests a more nationalist, inward-looking turn. The government insists that we're still outward-looking and internationalist in spirit instead of uh, what might have been Britain first, we have global Britain. Uh, but the effort involved in departing from the EU leads to its own challenges because it drains energy and resources from policymaking and risks protracted, uh, protracted arguments with countries that are our natural allies. The argument I wish to make, however, is that if we're going to have a serious reappraisal of our foreign policy, then the most important reason for this is not Brexit, but the shift in American attitudes and behavior. This is in part because it's not clear that future relations can be as close uh, in the past as they have been in the past, uh, but also because it's less clear what this partnership is supposed to achieve. The partnership with the United States can be traced back now almost 80 decade, eight, decade, eight decades to the Atlantic Charter agreed in August uh, 1941 between Churchill and Roosevelt. In the first instance, it was a move to save the British Empire. But over time, 
as Britain accepted the winds of change and the logic of decolonization, it provided an alternative basis for a global role. Without the continuing special relationship, our strategic perspectives might well have contracted along with our imperial holdings. After 1945, we needed to keep the United States, however, engaged because otherwise the demands of European security seemed to be too great to manage without American support in the face of the rise of the Soviet Union. If we had a role, it was to serve as a close supporter and wise counselor uh, to the United States, still assumed to be brash and inexperienced, but boasting the almighty dollar and enormous military power. By staying close, we could influence how American power was applied and also get help in sustaining our own power. But if we thought in this context we could go it alone, then the shock of the Suez adventure in 1956 was less than enough. From this episode, Harold Macmillan drew the conclusion that we should get even closer to the United States, especially as not long after it became apparent that we could not even sustain our nuclear strike force without American help. Then, in late 1962, the Pentagon announced that it would abandon the Skybolt missile that the UK intended to purchase to sustain its nuclear force, while the Secretary of Defense made disparaging remarks about the futility of small nuclear forces. This is the context that helps explain the shock effect of Dean Acheson's famous observation that Britain had lost an empire but failed to find a role. There was a curious implication, perhaps even reflected in the next panel, uh, that there had to be a distinctive role, um, even if not yet identified, to which the British should aspire. The quest to find such a role does continue to this day. The real point, however, was that Acheson was putting a question mark against the role we thought we already had found as being America's key partner. Soon, Macmillan got the immediate problem sorted with Kennedy at the December 1962 uh, Nassau summit when he gained agreement for the purchase of Polaris ballistic missile, a deal that has actually aged rather well. But others noticed that this meant a growing dependence upon the United States, most importantly, President de Gaulle. Uh, soon after Nassau, he vetoed the UK's application to join the common market therefore denying Macmillan a key plank of his strategy to revive the British economy. A decade later, President Pompidou withheld the veto and Britain joined the common market. This was again another time of uncertainty about where the Americans were going, marked by the shock of 1971 when Richard Nixon undermined the Bretton Woods system of international financial ex exchange, doubt about security guarantees to Europe as Congress angled to cut uh, by half American military deployments in Europe, and then the upheavals of Watergate. Part of the attraction to the UK at the time was as a hedge against the United States shirking its alliance obligations post-Vietnam. In principle, it was thought, the combination of the major European powers working together would provide a powerful block uh, capable of challenging American power where necessary. For a while, this seemed plausible, notably on Middle Eastern policy. Over time, however, the differences in capabilities and priorities limited the extent to which the, e the European Union could speak with one voice, although there were occasions, including Iran and Ukraine recently, when that has been done. But by and large, the European impact depended on cooperation between London, Paris, and Berlin as much as EU institutions. The great strategic advantage of the EU was in its ability to draw in other European countries and confirm their democratic standing and commitment to the rule of law, first Spain and Portugal after their dictatorships, Greece after the colonels, and then the post-communist countries after 1990. But in terms of crisis management, there were limits. As the EU, EU grew larger, decision-making became slower, and united positions were hard to define. In the late 90s, Tony Blair tried to make more of the EU's defense and security potential when he met with President Chirac at the Saint-Malo summit. This was again done as a hedge 
as he was frustrated by what he saw as an American tendency to withdraw into itself after the end of the Cold War, con uh, exemplified by constant difficulties over the former Yugoslavia. But Saint-Malo did not deliver on what was promised, not least because of tedious arguments over the appropriate division of labor between uh, the EU and NATO, but also because of the impact of 9-11, which led to Blair's shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder commitment to President Bush. By this time, anyway, the implications of the Maastricht Treaty were already pushing the UK away from the European mainstream. Maastricht had been ratified under John Major, but with a number of opt-outs, which made it more palatable to skeptics, but was leading to a semi-detached relationship, especially once the Blair government decided not to join the Eurozone. The conservative disenchantment with the EU was suppressed by the coalition with the Liberal Democrats, but once it had its own majority, the Cameron government decided that the issue had to be addressed once and for all. The case for leaving was that the UK was bound to get drawn into the striving for an ever closer union. The fact of semi-detachment meant that the heart of the, the case could not be the possibility, as it had been in the 1970s, for the, help, uh, for the UK to help make the EU a great strategic actor. To the contrary, uh, it much was claimed with little foundation about Britain being forced to join a European army. So the case for staying had to be about the risk to the economic benefit of Britain's membership resulting from the customs union, loss of the customs union and a single market. Now there is obviously an impact of Brexit in terms of Britain's ability to influence developments within the EU area, including, for example, the, uh, the authoritarianism and challenges to the rule of law now developing in a number of member countries. But precisely because the EU had never quite lived up to its expectations about its foreign policy potential, th otherwise it might not make that much difference. London can still work with Berlin, Paris, Rome, Madrid, and so on, outside of the EU structures. As we've seen with Iran, and as Chancellor Merkel has commented, even with Brexit, there is no reason why cooperation of this sort cannot be continued. This is why what's going on with Trump is much more important. Some have seen Trump's enthusiasm for Brexit and the possibilities for a new trade deal as heralding a new stage. I think it's already clear that the Johnson government is aware of the potential pitfalls in trade negotiations with the US and also the implications of the president's own and popularity in the UK. As pressing is coming to terms with Trump's expressed doubts about the US commitment to European security, as well as directions he has set for Euro American foreign policy that the UK is unwilling to follow. Let me emphasize this is not just about policy disagreements. These have always existed, often, as I mentioned, over the Middle East. They were even there during the golden years of Thatcher and Reagan. Nor is it about the limited, need, limited influence the British can exert over American policy. It's always the junior partner. The point is that since the Atlantic Charter, these two countries have worked together on a series of shared projects, winning the Second World War, conducting the Cold War, and then ending the Cold War, working out what to do after the Cold War, uh, and then together fighting the war on global terror. These common projects did not at all preclude disagreements on policy, but they did provide a shared framework with which these, within which these disagreements could be addressed and contained. But well before the 2008 financial, but well before Trump, the 2007-8 financial crisis, the growing importance of the Asia-Pacific region with the rise of China, and then the disheartening uh, results of the interventions in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, undermined confidence in the economic model offered by both countries and their political judgments. They helped drain popular enthusiasm for global intervention, for globalization, and an active international role. Trump has confirmed this trend and made it harder to imagine a return to the good old days. If the US is losing interest in its global role, 
What can there be left for the UK? Without joint projects, we are somewhat at a loss for what to do next. For the US, the next big project may, may be containing China. But as we've seen with the 5G controversy, there are limits to the part we can or wish to be, uh, be playing with this project, which is not to say there are not going to be some difficult choices ahead. For example, if Beijing continues to ask us collude in its own internal censorship. So here we are, an island at the more tranquil end of the Eurasian landmass with a reasonable climate, along with a decent climate and a way of life. The case for a quiet life and staying clear of trouble elsewhere is not so unreasonable or unappealing to many that it should be dismissed out of hand. Nor are those tempted by this case likely to be swayed by exaggerated threatmanship. In fact, there is a disposition these days to distress alarmist statements from governments, even when they're warranted. The case for international in engagement has to recognize that the strategic challenges we face now are different in kind and intensity from those of the past. It's true that we're not adjacent to countries that menace us or suffer their own internal turmoil. By and large, if we seek to get involved in other people's quarrels and misfortunes, this is a matter for choice rather than some irresistible, irresistible strategic imperative. But as we are seeing with the coronavirus at the moment or the knock-on effects of trade wars, climate change and cyber attacks, we are affected by events elsewhere even when we are not the immediate target. Moreover, if the United States continues to drift away from its past international roles, then we may, lack a com then we may lack not only a common project with our closest ally, but we'll, still, but we'll find our project worrying about what to do with the knock-on effects on European security. Macron worrying, uh, worrying perhaps undiplomatically, worrying perhaps undiplomatically about whether NATO is brain dead, um, has put some of this, uh, these concerns onto the table. The Secretary of Defence made a more modest but still telling contribution in the Sunday Times a few weeks ago, uh, as he also raised questions about the reliability of the US as an ally. The issue of why a collection of countries, and quite a number of the individual countries, with a GDP far greater than Russia's, needs the United States to provide security um, against Russia won't go away. While this is not an argument for encouraging the US to go, it is an argument for considering new structures for improving the efficiency of European defense spending and looking to its capacity to manage regional crises. European security without the United States raises questions for which there are no easy or quick answers. Can NATO continue without the US playing a leadership role? And that showed me an opinion poll this morning, uh, which suggests uh, throughout Europe uh, a reluctance to fight on behalf of NATO allies uh, who may need defending. Uh, the British are more prepared to fight than others. Um, for Europe as a whole, how does one replace the nuclear umbrella provided by the United States? Unlike France, Britain has already fully committed its nuclear deterrent to NATO, but it hardly seems by itself a credible source of extended deterrent. And our, not only Trident, but our other expensive and formidable capabilities, including the Queen Elizabeth class carriers and the uh, F-35 Lightnings, are intertwined with comparable American capabilities. They can't be disentangled very easily. So the, we have to be realistic. The, United, States, the UK, United Kingdom can't wean itself away from such a close, long-term relationship uh, in short order. But we, do, but we can still ask questions about how sovereign these capabilities will be in practice um, and how we will be able to respond to crises in which the United States may not be taking a serious interest. Uh, we can already see how other countries are taking the lead uh, with some regional crises. For example, France, Italy, and Spain uh, uh, in, in North Africa. But 
not always harmoniously. Uh, we need to think how we fit in, if at all, to these endeavours. We also need to accept that we can't cover up gaps in our capabilities by diplomatic cleverness. Um, as well as the cutbacks to the FCO and the reputational damage resulting from the way Brexit has been handled up to now, we are hampered by a general decline in multilateralism. This is a natural consequence of an American administration with little interest in playing the liberal hegemon, along with deadlock in the Security Council, which remains our best bet when it comes to exercising influence. It's striking how often discussion of the UK's role depends on a self-image as a master of multilateralism, paragon of pragmatism, bridge builder extraordinaire, and now upholder of a rules-based order. An effective foreign policy has to be based on actual contributions as much as negotiating skills. There are a number of areas where high-quality generic capabilities might have value um, away, from stand, uh, away from their application in standard military contingencies. Climate change, for example, is no longer just a matter of reducing emissions, but also adaptive mitigation to address the dire consequences of the changes already built into weather patterns, such as rising sea levels and extreme weather events. Cyber attacks and information campaigns can be led by hostile states, but also come from criminal, organize criminal organizations, as well as mischievous individuals. Humanitarian distress can be the result of both natural disasters and civil wars. There is plenty for a substantial national security establishment to do if it can serve as the basis for a range of international, indeed in some cases domestic engagement, uh, and has a built-in ability to move with agility and flexibility between them. We can see with GCHQ how a high-quality organization can have some generic capabilities um, able to deal with a wide variety of challenges, including attacks on the nation's infrastructure, to extortion rackets and serious fraud, to child sexual abuse, as well as signals intelligence to support military preparations and operations. The various responsibilities that come under the remit of the FCO stabilization unit demonstrate the need for holistic thinking in the areas of conflict avoidance and post-conflict recovery. The armed forces uh, can address a wide range of non-military contingencies, including disaster relief. They're invaluable in situations which require logistic organization and large numbers of well-trained personnel. The expenditure on the carriers may only be justified if we start to think how they can be used in ways other than high-end military operations. At a time when it's very difficult to identify single, all-consuming contingencies to guide our thinking, we therefore need to be looking to develop capabilities with a range of potential applications. As the reorientation of our economy post-Brexit is going to be demanding, the same point can be made about industrial capacity, especially as the coming review worries about how to pay for MOD's forward programme. This coming review, therefore, I think needs to be capabilities-based rather than threat-based. That is, rather than identify the problems we intend to solve, um, the current uncertainties argue for developing a capacity to respond to a variety of issues, um, and not all the result of actions by hostile, hostile powers. The case for international engagement, therefore, should not start with a from a presumption that we are a global power to which others look for leadership. If we want leadership, we have to earn it, and in many cases we should be content to follow the lead of others. The case for engagement depends recognizing not only how much we are affected by all sorts of things going on in the world, but also that we can contribute to easing problems and finding remedies. This requires a realistic sense of what we can and cannot contribute and should certainly avoid the sort of self-flattery that makes others wince. More positively, we should welcome the country's relative security and our many advantages as we seek to make the most of them, and try to think imaginatively about how to build on the strengths we have. This is a difficult time, 
uh, for the international system. Many uncertainties, anxieties, and quite a lot of bad temper. Uh, Britain uh, has a contribution to work out uh, in, in, in all of this. It's not a role in the world in a sense of a position that if it wasn't there, everything else would collapse around us because we don't have that capacity anymore, even if we once had. What it is, uh, is, a, is a number of strengths that if we uh, look after carefully uh, and apply sensibly, can make a difference. It's a modest role, it's a modest role, uh, but one that may nonetheless be worth playing. Thank you. Laurie's going to take questions, and because I can, I'm going to start. Uh, just by, I mean, you said quite rightly, Laurie, that you can still cooperate with the European Union even if you're not a member state. But do you see it as feasible that we can become a bitter economic competitor of the European Union while remaining a close security partner? And I suppose Exhibit A there is Galileo, where you could argue that commercial interests overrode any shared security interest in the development of that program? Yes, I mean, Galileo came quite early on in the process in some ways. Um, unfortunately, I mean, I, 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 undoubtedly, I think Galileo, it was an unfortunate episode. Um, look, we're, we're, we're entering a period of, um, uh, of competition but, and cooperation, but this is quite normal with a whole range of countries. Uh, just look at the, the contortions everybody gets into when they're talking about their relations with China, which is a far more extreme case. So I don't think, uh, I mean, by and large, uh, we're still going to be pretty dependent upon each other economically. And by and large, Britain is still going to be a major part of, partner for cooperation on defence projects because there aren't many other obvious partners around. So I don't, I, uh, I don't see this as an either-or thing. There's a, there's a tension that's undoubtedly there. And with all of these things, if you manage it badly, it'll get worse. Uh, the, the, there's, uh, there's nothing guaranteed in this process that we, that we end up in the sunlit uplands. There, there, there are plenty of possibilities for things going quite badly. But I think it, with, with sufficient seriousness on both sides, I think that the, these can still be, be mitigated, but it depends. There are choices yet to be made. The gentleman here had his hand up first. I don't know. Do we? Um, Keith Best, former MP and ex military. I want to come back to the point you made about NATO's willingness to fight. Some while ago, I was talking to uh, an Estonian MP who represents part of Tallinn. I put to her what I call the nightmare scenario that as we see with Putin chancing it both in Crimea and now to the next region of uh, Ukraine, that um, one day the tanks will roll into central Tallinn in support of the one-third ethnic Russians that actually live there and find it very difficult to get Estonian citizenship for a variety of reasons. And I said, please assure me, assuage my fears that this is not true. She said, that's precisely the planning scenario that we adopt. Uh, it seems to me if the tanks do roll in one day into Central Square Tallinn, that is either World War III or the end of NATO, without sounding too dramatic about it. I wonder if you thought those were the two options, and if so, which one was <laughs> most likely, uh, or if there's a third option. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of like the, the old Woody Allen, well, one, one path leads to hopelessness and utter despair, the other leads to misery and destruction. Let's hope we have the wisdom to choose <laughs> between the two. Um, uh, I, I, um, so around 2014-15, that was the scenario that was most on, on people's mind. And... Um, Putin boasted about the ease with which he could get to uh, Kiev, Warsaw, Tallinn, all sorts of places. Um, it would be a struggle. First, it would be a struggle. Secondly, as I, th you, know, you have to ask why, if that was the case, hasn't he taken over Ukraine? And, and the reason is 
um, but it would be a struggle um, because the Ukrainian population um, would not take kindly to it. So I don't, I, I don't think we should under, I mean, we've got experience ourselves that occupations aren't desperately popular. Um, uh, even if you've got a third of the population which uh, has some ties to Russia. Um, so I think first, you know, we have to be careful about the scenario. Secondly, all that being said, um, the Baltic states, more than others, uh, are very conscious and worried about these, these tendencies in, in Europe. Um, would Italy seriously think that this was an important priority uh, for them. But Germany, I mean, I think that's where a lot of the questions are going to have to be mm. asked. If it's the case that Germany is moving uh, to the opposite, if you like, of, of the Germany we once feared, um, then uh, it's going to be very hard to sustain uh, a strong solidarity collective defense framework. Uh, I think a lot of Germans are well aware of that, but a lot of, a lot of Germans uh, see the possibilities uh, for a quiet life as well. So I think the, the, there are some big questions, but um, for us, again, it comes back, we can play our part, we can do things um, w with, uh, with Northern Europe in ways uh, that we, 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 we are already doing. Uh, but the big questions are not only what, what's, what American attitude is going to be, but what a, what a German attitude. It's one of the fantastic paradoxes of European integration, isn't it? If you'd said to the founding fathers, the biggest problem we're going to face is getting the Germans to deploy force, <laughs> they'd, they'd have cracked open the champagne. Uh, Jonathan. Indeed. Um, Jonathan Alton here from the Institute. I wonder if I could, uh, you spent quite rightly, I think, most of your time looking at the United States and the relationship with the United States. I wonder if I could turn you around to Europe and to a bit of crystal ball gazing. Namely, a lot of the discussion has been as, about trade, as you mentioned, but do you think that there is an, a, a sort of a beginning of a discussion in the European Union about how the Union would look without Britain in security terms? And do you think that the dynamics of whatever happens in terms of security arrangements inside Europe will necessitate our continued involvement in these discussions, whether we like it or not? It's a very difficult question. I think the answer to the second question to a degree is yes. I mean, if you have rule of law issues with some of the Visegrad countries, for example, that's a NATO matter uh, as well as an EU matter. Um, if you're looking at you know, what's been going on in Libya, for example, um, there doesn't really seem to be much of an EU common position at the moment. Um, and whether or not this is, an, an, I mean, having committed our air power in, in, in 2011, we haven't done an awful lot else since. Um, so again, if, I think Prime Minister suggested the other day that if a peacekeeping force was needed, then maybe that's something to which we would contribute. So uh, in, that, in that sense, I, I think Britain could well be involved. There's a much larger and more difficult question about how well the EU itself can hold together on these questions. You know, there's a problem in the UK debate because uh, as a result of its polarization over the last few years, there's one group that is just desperate to, to demonstrate that the EU is gonna completely fall apart and fragment. Uh, While well, there's another part that believes it's going onwards and upwards um, in a blazing unity. Um, and the truth is, it's obviously somewhere in between, but some of the divisions on these issues are quite serious. Um, and you know, we have to look back in the past, and, and a lot of the time, when there were spats between European countries, it was often the United States that came in and sorted them out. Uh, and that's not a role the Americans are particularly playing at the moment. Um, yeah. It's an interesting question. Uh, in earlier times, whether an, Amer an American administration would have let the whole Brexit thing develop quite the way 
it did, whether it, whether it would have been much more involved in trying to broker some sort of um, different relationship between the UK uh, and the rest of the EU. So I think it's another area where, uh, without a strong enforcer within the EU of, of, of its rules, um, it'll fray uh, uh, and, and tensions will develop. You know, I think the challenge uh, being posed by Hungary and Poland at the moment is a very serious one um, uh, and, and is recognised as such in Brussels. So, um, I, European politics is going to be very complicated and, a, and, a, and a, an organisation now of 27 is, uh, is too big, I think, to be able to impose a common will Throughout, so it will. So it's not just a question of two-speed Europe's and, uh, and circles. There's going to. It's going to be a much more uh, complex politics. If you have something really serious, like another eurozone crisis, it'll get even worse. So um, we're going to be. You know, people can talk about us being rule takers rather than rule makers. We're going to be crisis takers as well. Um, if, if things are going on that the EU can't solve, we'll feel it still. Um, and, uh, and I suspect that will lead to you know, more conversations going on. This particular scenario is hard to, hard to judge. Uh, and, and as I've, my last book was largely warning against uh, trying to predict too much into the future, I think I'll try and follow my own guidance on that. I think... To avoid this becoming some sort of farce with the microphone, I'm going to do questions over there, then do questions over there. So, Mike. Do you want to... uh, Mike Gapes, recovering politician. <laughs> um, can I um, ask you about the long-term trend in American politics? You mentioned Trump, but we've had previous presidents who were unilateralist, who um, didn't wish the United States to be bound by international institutions, the US never signed up to the International Criminal Courts, etc., etc. How much is Trump just a continuation of that process in a more extreme version, or something new? Um, well, I just tried to suggest in, in the talk, he's, an, he's a continuation. I mean, you can see um, a lot of the trends there already. But he, he's, he, it's rather an abrupt... Um, turn in some ways because at least uh, past presidents remembered their language uh, uh, and said the right things. I mean, you know, you look at um, a lot of the foreign relations of the United States documents. Uh, he listened to Nixon talking about guarantees to, our, to allies in his, uh, when he's, uh, he doesn't think anybody is recording it. Um, and it's, it's not pretty. Um, so, you know, we have to be clear on all of that. But nonetheless, the US has acquired over the decades about 70 or so different alliances and obligations and partnerships and so on, upon which much of the world depends. And when you start to see um, people who've relied on these for some time seriously start to doubt them, as opposed to you know, accept there's a sort of game going on in, in which they make offer guarantees which we profess to accept because it sort of works. But when, but when that, uh, the disenchantment sets in, and you just have to listen to Japanese policymakers at the moment, in particular, I think, who are really very worried about where all this is going. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I think you felt that, that you know maybe this is just a, the tipping point. Maybe it's been building up for some time, and Trump's pushing it over the edge. And you know maybe if um, uh, if a different politician wins in um, at the end of this year, there'll be a degree of recovery. But the problem remains that it's not immediately evident to Americans, people and politicians, why they should be doing all the things that we expect them to do. Um, and we've taken, it for, we've taken it for granted. The Allies have taken it for granted. Um, and you, know, you can just you know, to take an example. Um, the, the, the general unanimity in the States, going back to an earlier point, about German defense spending. 
Um, I mean, you know, this issue was raised well before Trump, and it's not being addressed by Germany. So I, I, it's, I don't see us ever going, rewinding and going back to uh, the sort of strength that you did see in, in, uh, in earlier decades. And um, it would be unwise to assume that in the future, the, the ties that bind us won't get even looser. Hi there, I think it's me. <clears throat> um, can I ask a question about the relationship slightly further afield? Um, you implied that there was a kind of quiet option on the corner of Europe um, and a potential retreat from prioritizing the kind of European Atlantic relationships. But for the past few centuries, that security and stability is dependent on prosperity. And that prosperity is largely dependent on a kind of third pillar of our foreign policy, which at first was colony, then was commonwealth. And now we kind of describe under the lazy rubric of emerging economies. And I think that's only going to get truer um, in the coming century in East Asia by the mid-century and in sub-Saharan Africa by the end of it. Um, and could you speak to the tensions between the need for more activism and adventurism for prosperity further afield with a, a retreat in the midway in Europe and the Atlantic? Thank you. I think we're not in a mercantilist sort of age. Um, no, we could, we could return to one. Um, uh, and I think sometimes the... Um, I mean, the thing to look at at the moment is, is China's Belt and Road, um, because uh, it's an interesting example. Uh, I, I'm not sure how, if they intended it this way, but it, but it now looks like a form of sort of neo-colonialism, uh, where they provide real assets and infrastructure and so on, but also uh, impose under requiring liabilities of their own, which at some point may... Uh, May they may not find so acceptable, uh, but it's an interesting example. Uh, so one of the questions is how much does trade, economic cooperation, <laughs> depend on doing something on the security side? Um, if we want, as I think we should, uh, be more, more engaged with Africa, um, what is that about? Um, various forms of uh, security and development assistance, or can we focus very hard on, on, on developing areas of economic strength within Africa? Those are the sorts of questions that I think will become important. You know, the, it, it's, we have a lot of ways, I and mean, Commonwealth is a good example, of keeping in touch with lots of countries uh, uh, and being there. But it, it, in the end, um, these aren't going to wholly shape the policies of these other countries. So we have to just keep that, uh, uh, be careful, again, be modest about what we claim. And oddly, you know, going back to Atchison's famous comment, um, a lot of the last uh, 60 years has uh, masked the fact that we lost an empire. So much of what has... Um, uh, so much of our foreign policy and our expectations was shaped during the imperial period. Now, you know, I, I don't think Brexit was about imperial nostalgia and so on. I think the country suffers, if anything, from imperial amnesia. Um, but um, while we had an empire, then we had a reason to be global. Absolutely, because we had lots of things, assets to defend. We don't have those anymore to the, the Falklands and, and now maybe Gibraltar again. Um, we don't have those anymore. And so making the case for active engagement away from Europe is much harder. I mean, I think that, that's, uh, that's the, the only point. While the Cold War was on, that was a reason to be global. But, you know, again, you know, recall that uh, it, we ended the role east of Suez in the late 60s. Uh, that was when we decided we couldn't really... Uh, be a, a global uh, uh, defense power. And you know, occasionally there's nostalgia for that uh, because things happen and, and we suddenly need, we need to get, see we need to get involved a bit. But, you know, again, think about China. Think about what we can seriously do vis-a-vis -vis China and you start to see the limits 
uh, of that sort of expectation. There's a gentleman here in the third row. Oh, there's someone. All right. Hello, uh, oh. Sparkle Dennis. I'm at the War Studies Department, current MA student. And as you know, there are those in Europe who are pushing for European strategic autonomy. And I'm curious, do you think the UK is going to be supportive of that? Or do you think they're going to be more skeptical and push back against it in order to maintain the relationship with the US? And then along with that, do you think European strategic autonomy is even like realistically achievable? So the answer to the second question is no. Um, because um, there isn't uh, agreement on, on what the foreign policy they should be supporting. Uh, there are big differences in priorities uh, and a readiness to engage, which is why uh, I don't think uh, that you know, the French, for example, take it that seriously at all. I mean, rhetorically maybe, but not much beyond that. I mean, this is one of the most irritating features of the Brexit debate was this continual harping on about this drive to a European army, which a moment's thought told you wasn't going to happen, not in the way people were talking about, and people mistook uh, quite useful, I mean, perfectly useful things that we should support in terms of dealing with piracy or peacekeeping or, or whatever things that you could never expect NATO to do, um, for a real alternative to NATO, which it wasn't. Um, so, uh, I don't know, a lot of European countries never really thought it was. So uh, I, think, I think this sort of trend in, in, in European discourse has been unfortunate uh, because, it, again, it's promised much more than was ever going to be delivered and has ducked from, uh, away from a lot of the main, main problems. I mean, you know, if you have the same... If, when you just think about how the currency union um, has developed and the fact that a lot of the underpinnings of that are still not in place, which is why we worry about the future crisis, then you can see how in the, de in the defense field, the underpinnings are uh, 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 even further away. Yeah. Good morning. Um, uh, thank you very much, Professor Friedman. I am uh, uh, General Salgado, Spanish Army, posted in a NATO headquarters in Gloucestershire. So, interestingly, I am the first Spanish general posted in the UK in history. We sent we send another one in the Spanish Armada with not very good <laughs> we, are, we are all not very lucky I'm with the weather. I'm glad you made it this time. <laughs> so, it's a, my position is really interesting because I see both sides, the Spanish and the, and the British side, and the strong relationship we have, uh, actually, and also the NATO position. So... My, my, on my view, on my view, the, the Brexit is just part of a disintegration of Europe. And it's probably the trigger for separatist movement or nationalism. You see in Catalonia, a Basque country, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and other regions in Europe. So for me, it's really dangerous, to be honest, on my view. Um, and also the, the threat we have in Europe could be, okay, in the other side of the Baltic states, the Ru Russia, but also in the south, in Africa. So in, three, in 30 years, the population will double, will be double in, in, in Africa. And we saw, as Spaniards, we saw this as a real, a factual threat more than Mr. Putin. But my question is, so what do you think about that? It's a, it's a, it's a, the, 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 it's, is Europe, will be Europe more weaker uh, in the future? Um, and who is the factual winner? Is it uh, Europe? I don't think so. Is it Mr. Putin or is the U United States of America? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not sure there are winners, and that's part of the problem. Um, I mean, I think the, I, I mean, Putin may be enjoying all sorts of things that are going on, but the fact is his economy uh, remains incredibly weak. Um, and his, achi I mean, his achievements, certainly in Europe, are, are limited. And uh, you're right, I think, to draw attention to the fragmentary pressures uh, in Europe. Uh, and, you know, 
some ways these would have been much worse without the EU, um, I think especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, but as a number of people have, have shown uh, in, in books that have come out recently, uh, perhaps we exaggerated the extent, say, to which uh, the former communist countries were readily integrated in, into the political structures uh, and economic structures of Europe. No, the depopulation these countries have, have suffered. And then you see the refugee crisis coming in. And these are, I mean, the refugee crisis, which, you know, again, was played on during the, the referendum debate. But, um, you know, the British watched a lot of this rather than actively engaged. Um, and I think, you know, I think you're quite right to, to draw attention to, to North Africa, where there's an awful lot going on at the moment. The French are very engaged for, in Mali and so on. We're doing bits with them there. Um, but I, if you talk to people in this country, I think it's, it's pretty low down um, in, in their list. I mean, they might recognize Putin as a security threat. They might see China. Uh, but what's going on in North Africa, I don't think registers very much at all. ISIS in, uh, um, they might know, Iran they might know, but not that. Yet, as you say, to, to a lot of Southern Europeans, this is absolutely critical. So uh, I think you know, the problem is that there are just, it's not so much that we're, we're going to be sort of fighting each other, we just have different priorities uh, and uh, they pull in different directions. And to ask the same organization um, to prioritize all of these things is, is, I think, going to become harder. But who benefits? I, I, I don't think, um, in the end, anybody particularly benefits from this. I don't think Russia is strong enough to take full advantage uh, of what, or even Russia is sure about what its own objectives are. I think a lot of its objectives are quite defensive. Um, you know, by and large, unless you, you know, if you allow these sort of things to start to undermine solidarity a cohesion, an economic cooperation, then the general effect is just negative. Okay, well, I'm going to try and squeeze four in, so can you keep these short, please? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, Ewan Grant, former law enforcement intelligence analyst. I've worked in EU programs in the ex-Soviet states and in a uh, prototype um, CSDP EU project. Um, my question follows from those experiences. Um, uh, understanding of all this in the EU, distinction between the EU member states and the European Commission and central EU bureau bureaucracy, how much is, are the kind of things you've been talking about seeping into the standing institutions of the European Commission, the EAS, but also others, um, as opposed to the member states. Because it seems that the Commission is really dependent on a few number of engaged individuals, and it's not yet in their DNA. Thank you. Hans Kandanani from Chatham House. Um, I want you to come back to this quiet life strategy that you talked about. Um, very much agree with you that um, that uh, you have to make the case for international engagement now. It's not obvious that there's public support for the kind of strategy that Britain's followed in most of the post-war period, punching above our weight and all that. Um, but it strikes me that there is potentially a sort of cost to that um, quiet life strategy. Um, and this is where Britain is a bit different from Germany, which you also mentioned as sort of possibly pursuing that option. Um, and one aspect of that is the UN, uh, the permanent UN Security Council seat. Um, obviously, UN reform is, is you know, kind of difficult. It might be that we hold on to it anyway, but it, surely it would be increasingly difficult to justify the seat um, if we um, do adopt this kind of quiet life strategy. So I guess my question to you is, um, how much does that matter? Sorry, are we doing them all again? Uh, we can do, yes. Okay, sorry, James, La <coughs> James Landell, BBC. Um, so, Lawrence, can you just tell us a bit more, please, about how you think British governments can get to a place where they can adopt this kind of more pragmatic, realistic foreign policy that you set out? Because 
do you think it requires some kind of national debate uh, as, as a country, as a, as a state, about what role we think we ourselves should play in the role? Because it strikes me that whenever politicians, policymakers advocate this kind of policy, they tend to get dumped on from a large height by people accusing them of being unambitious, defeatist, etc. Thank you. Do you want to start answering these ones? Okay, no, sorry, I thought. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, Alan's the one to ask about how, how well the Commission is adapting. Uh, uh, I mean, all I noticed were when the new Commission was launched, um, that it was all in sort of multilateral speak. Um, and lots of aspirations uh, about how great things were going to be achieved by this, but not an awful lot of sense of, of, of how it was going to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think in the situation we're describing, it's very hard for the Commission, however accomplished they are as individuals, uh, to set the terms of the debate and, and enforce the rules and so on. I think that that, we'll, we'll see how well they do. The UN question is a really interesting one. Um, and, the, and there's two sides of it. One, um, when the Security Council is working well, which you know, at times in the 1990s it seemed like it, it was doing, then the UK could and did play an active role. But when it's deadlocked, um, there's, a, there's a, lot, a lot of issues it is at the moment, um, then it doesn't have the salience uh, that, it, that it might have had. It'd become, uh, and the question of whether we can justify our position as a Security Council member, uh, which is also one for France, one might say as well, um, Fortunately, in a way, it's very difficult to actually put it in a way that leads to anything because there's absolutely no agreement uh, on who else should become Security Council members and Security Council reform uh, is, uh, has been going on for decades with very little uh, discussion, going on for decades with very little to show for it other than a you know, sort of a series of understandings um, that certain countries really should become non-permanent members more often uh, because, uh, because of the contributions they can make. So um, it's true that, that if, I mean, I'm, I'm clear, I'm obviously not advocating uh, opting out. Uh, it's true that, that, that if you're not doing very much, then uh, you may have to justify more at home in, in some ways what actually is the point of sitting there uh, as a permanent member, um, uh, you know, we are the, the, it so happens that the five permanent members are all declared nuclear powers, uh, and that it, that counts for something. Um, and, and it so happens that all of them uh, have got quite long histories of uh, 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 with active international roles. Um, it used to be the case that the question was asked why the EU needed two, uh, two countries on the Security Council. That, that issue has now gone away. Uh, so I, I, I think it's, it's there, but I don't think, I don't think it's, it's going to be pressing. Let me, I, mean, I think, let me just move on to the, the, the question of, of national debate. Um, in 1997 eight, when Labour, new Labour, had its um, security, defence and security review, I think, uh, I think it was just called a defence review then. Um, it was very clear that it was going to be a foreign policy-led review rather than a treasury-led review. Um, and there were lots of debates. I mean, it started off with, with lots of debates, so, uh, which was quite fun because uh, the defence secretary, uh, George Robertson, um, and the foreign secretary, Robin Cook, Inevitably, both as Scots uh, didn't get on that well, uh, and uh, there were some great debates between the two in, in, in seminars and uh, um, sitting in one in, in Birmingham. Um, uh, so there's absolutely no reason why you can't encourage serious discussion. I, I, I think we're not going to resolve the issues this year 
they're too complicated, too many of them, uh, and too much uncertain while the negotiations are continuing, even assuming that we can get out of transition by the end of the year. Um, so I think there's a, a lot to be said for having um, uh, not just sort of a programmatic review, but some serious discussions. I thought the, the piece by uh, the Defence Secretary Wallace in the, um, in the Times, Sunday Times was a good start. I think it, it, it was right that this issue about uh, US reliability was raised. Uh, I was surprised it didn't get more response. Uh, so I, I, I think it, I don't, it, whether we can reach a national consensus, I tend to doubt. I mean, you know, this is a very divided country at the moment. But at least we should air some of the issues and take it down from some of the grand rhetorical flourishes, uh, which we've been dogged, especially over the last few years, uh, to some rather, you know, more practical things about what we should do. You know, if the sort of approach I'm trying to suggest, which argues for a degree of centralization of capabilities and, or the management of these capabilities, um, which creates its own tensions within government. Um, but, you know, just asking for more interdepartmental coordination doesn't really cut it. Um, if that's the case, then that, that's an argument, again, that, that has to be made. Uh, and, and, the values, and, the, and the value of generic approaches rather than very specific threat-related approaches uh, demonstrated. So uh, I'm all in favor, I mean, uh, academics tend to be in favor of big national debate because uh, it keeps us busy. Um, but I, I, I think in this case, there's, uh, especially after uh, the sort of very fractious period in our political history, uh, there's something to be said for just talking with each other and trying to work out where all this can go. I'm afraid we've run out of time, Laurie, but can I just say, uh, as I expected you would, you've got us off to a fantastic start, so thank you so much for kicking us off in such style. <clears throat>